Just a little bit about the history and the significance of what you're seeing here today. Just on the other side of Dollar General Store, running from east to west, was the old Walton Road. Now in 1788, the North Carolina military group wanted to put together a road leading westward as the migration of people started in Indian Territory. So everybody that came through here had a military escort if they wanted to be safe. The first known record of the white people or the European settlers seeing an object one mile just down the Woodcliff Road from where you're standing is in 1788 as that road was being placed through here on top of an Indian war path to the Montesquieu's Trail that, that everything was built on. Later on we had the Avery Trace and we had the Walton Road. As the people got near an area down here now, there's a historical marker there, and I hope you take time to go see it. They, they saw something that McLean's history of, of, of 1925 described as a large gray dog in a setting position made of sandstone facing west, and we believe it to be as high as that stone monument that you see there, some 16 feet high. In 1979, Tennessee Tech University, the Department of Geology and Geography analyzed, and we actually took a chip of that stone, analyzed it according to the chips of the rocks, the rock bed down here where the historical marker is, and we fingerprinted it, if you will, knowing exactly where it stood. But now, the significance of this stone is much. This is the only memorial in America to the voluntary movement of the Cherokees west of the Mississippi River. What did I just say? Everybody knows about the 18 and 38 forced march of the Trail of Tears. Most people are not familiar with Thomas Jefferson's edict that the Indians were going to have to move sooner or later, and some of the Indians that lived in the upper Cumberland, the Cherokees, saw the writing on the wall and they gathered together about 10 years, we think, before 1838, around their worship piece, this big, large, gray dog that stood one mile west of here. In essence, it became their departure point, their worship ground. We learned about this from an article that you can read in the 1897 Cookville Press. The interesting thing about this was that it became such a notoriety, a, no, a point of notoriety, that you can go to the Cartridge Gazette, which is the oldest paper in the state of Tennessee that you can still, still read and still in existence. You can read about events that happened around here in 1810, and, and in 18 and 11 we learned that this was so significant, the rock, the monument, if you will, the uh, the standing stone monolith, that people started chipping stones pieces away from it and began to obliterate it. Now, this railroad you see behind me here got here in 1893. As the railroad was being shot up from Cookville, starting in 1890, surveyed across, of all things, the railroad bed just happened to be surveyed directly, couldn't have missed it by an inch or more, directly over that dog monolith. We have a photograph of the destruction Dr. Cal Dickinson discovered this uh, a couple of years ago. We got a photograph of the destruction of the original dog. And the people, the Cookville group, known as the Narragansett Tribe Number 25, it was a fraternal organization called the Improved Order of Red Men, the only charter fraternity in America by Congress. And we have a representative here that we're going to be introducing momentarily. They saw the significance of the pieces of rock of this monolith dog that had been blown up by the railroad coming in. So they decided to do something about it. Now we know from looking at the rock, which weighs 816 pounds on top of the lighthouse, notice I said lighthouse, shape, money. That rock on top is the only known remaining fragment of that monolith, that dog shape, that stood one mile west of here. Now the interesting thing about this, by reading on that stone, it speaks in terms of Neyakataki, which is Cherokee, meaning standing stone. And on there it says, corn, C-O-R-N, corn moon. 
Now, we know exactly when the corn moon was because that's the natural of the order of red man for the month of September. So, we know that the carbon was done in the month of September. But what happened in, in 1893 when the railroad track got to Monterey, stopped right in here, they put Colonel Lord of Red Men out of Cookville on the Narragansett Tribe, number 25. They took their name from the Rhode Island Indians, and that's another story if you want to know that story. That's why that's a lighthouse. But they had so much significance on the Cherokee worship piece, the monolithic dog. They picked up the smaller, the two largest fragments, which you see up there right now. Weighed 816 pounds, loaded it on a flat car of that railroad, the new railroad car, took it to the Marble Works and took them. The Wilson guy that was a surprise had carbons on it. They brought it back up there in 1895, just before they put it on top of this stone. We have a photograph of this monument, of this monument here without the stone on it. They gave that stone up there a spirit as if it was a spirit alive. They took the time to take that stone, which was now carved, off of that railroad bed and carried it over to its original site. We've got a photograph of them, the red men, the Narragansett tribe number 25, with their photograph around that stone before they put it back on the flat, flat car, brought it right to the railroad track, brought it right across through here, and mounted it on top of that. Now, on a crisp October 13th day in 1895, uh, if you go on the back of this stone, you'll see that it says Traveling Moon. The tenth sign, which means that the original carving on the back side meant that this monument was going to be dedicated on the 10th day of October. 18 and 95, but dignitaries couldn't get up here, so they had to postpone it one week. Now, this dedication took place here on a Thursday morning in 18 and 95 on October the 17th. Now, in 1979, as Attorney Dale Behannon has uh, uh, mentioned, then Mayor Ray Way. Myself, Dale Behannon, and others got right over here, about where the little uh, monument is, snowing like all get out. And Mayor Ray Way took a proclamation drawn up by Attorney Dale Behannon, and he signed that is proclaiming, now notice carefully, the second Thursday in the month of October to be Standing Stone Day as long as the mountain shall be. Now, why do we celebrate it on a Saturday? We celebrate Standing Stone Day on a Saturday so more people can come. Thursday is a work day for most people. So this happened in 1979, in the month of February, and it was so cold here, we had to end up going down to what used to be the Monterey Hospital down in the basement, which was then the City Hall, to finish the proclamation. But that October, in 1979, we started our Standing Stone celebration here, and we had visitors from England, we had the Red Man Tribe, we had uh, uh, Al Gore, who was a representative at that time, he was here, we had a lot of speeches, a lot of dignitaries, and now you today are here to witness the 33rd celebration that started 32 years ago. So I really appreciate, on behalf of those that are the generations that have gone before us, not only the Native Americans, but the uh, Fraternal Order of Red Men, the uh, citizens of Monterey that can't be here today because they, they are now passed. We appreciate each of you coming. And now, as I've told people for years, this stone belongs to you. This is your spirit. So thank you for coming today. We appreciate your attendance.